Hey, good morning, everybody. I, I needed that little jazzy intro today. I think that this kind of uh, gloomy post Labor Day weather has me feeling just a little down, but hey, that's why I'm excited because today's conversation is going to be a lift up, and that's exactly what we all need. So thanks for joining me on this Wednesday morning for DC Live. I have been anticipating my guest for today, and I'm so excited to talk to her. She is fabulous in every way. Of course, Dr. Eve Hall from the Milwaukee Urban League is coming up in just a couple of seconds, but I wanna give a quick shout out, uh, just a few things. One, I hope everybody had a fantastic Labor Day weekend and was able to do some uh, fun things uh, enjoying some of the nice weather that we had anyway here in Milwaukee. And also back to school. How's that going, everybody? So interesting. Um, you know, I, I, of course, Adam started back at school, Wauwatosa West, his ninth year teaching theater. Uh, I can't even tell you in our house, you know, style is important to us. So we've been on this uh, mission to match the mask to the outfit. And I'll keep you posted on how many days <laughs> we can do it. I'm not quite sure. So far, day one and day two has been uh, really good. But anyway, I just am so impressed by the patience and, and grace of our teachers and families and hope that everybody can uh, do their best getting back to it. And, and I wish everyone well. This is my adorable niece, Harmony. She was due to start at Longfellow Middle School in Tosa um, as a new sixth grader at middle school. So she started her day virtually. Um, and my, my great sister, Kim, uh, kind of put this sign on her front door, uh, like to the entrance of, of Longfellow, welcoming her to, to middle school. So. We, you know, everyone's doing their best to make this uh, exciting and, and, and as smooth as possible, but I just want to wish everyone well as we get the school year started. And you might have seen Milwaukee Magazine, who is the face of stylish events? Yes. Uh, so check out Milwaukee Faces. Um, or Faces of Milwaukee, I should say. So fun in the September issue of Milwaukee Magazine. This is a great shot. We had so much fun doing this at the Wisconsin Club um, downtown. You know, gotta just make it a little bit quirky, throw in some inflatable flamingos and things like that. So check it out, super fun. And I also am excited to let you know that we have two spectacular guests for next week. So stay tuned at the end of the broadcast. I'm gonna fill everybody in on what next week will be. So good morning to everybody. We are gonna get started. I am, like I said, so thrilled to have Dr. Eve Hall. I'm gonna bring her into stream now. Uh, Dr. Eve Hall is the president and CEO of the Milwaukee Urban League. Good morning. Good morning. I love that picture of you on that magazine. Is that funny? I, I knew you'd like those flamingos. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are looking just fab and blue, and I'm so excited to start my day with you. Thank you. <laughs> Now, you know, there's so many things that we have to talk about and so many things going on. I'm always so impressed to be keeping up with what your team is doing in the community and um, what your leadership brings to the Urban League. Just so impressive in so many ways. And we're going we're gonna to cover a lot of that. And, you know, I wanted to start because... Actually, I should tell our viewers, this is so cool. You know, I, the first moment that I had with you, I'm going to bring a picture into stream, was when we were together. Oh, Do you yeah. remember? Yes, I loved that. That was a great panel. <laughs> yeah, so we were together on a panel uh, way at the start of after the DNC was announced coming to Milwaukee. And um, this was really our first kind of meeting. And I was so excited. I remember going home and telling uh, my family that I was just like met this great lady today and she's just right on top of it. And I, I was so impressed. Um, so that was so cool. And, and I'm glad that that opportunity brought us brought us together. What, you know, I don't know, I find it so hard. Sometimes this summer, I've been kind of thinking about 
what could have been. I know it's not the best way to, to, to go, but sometimes you just have to. Were you finding yourself thinking the same? I was, you know, because when I think back to that panel, which I thank you for uh, reminding me of that moment when we did really meet and have a great conversation. And, you know, it was so, there was so much hope and excitement at that time, David, about what was going to be happening in Milwaukee. Um, and we were really up there also making sure that inclusion was, you know, a part of the theme and just how we would make sure that so many parts and sectors of our community would benefit and not and never to even imagine that COVID, you know, that a pandemic would hit and just totally blow us out of the water to basically a zero presence. You know, I think the, right. the good thing about, um, you know, if we have a takeaway is we did have a chance to be highlighted nationally as a city in a way that I don't think we've ever been before. So once we truly recover as a country, um, you know, I am hopeful that Milwaukee will still remain on people's minds because they learned more about our city. So, you know, we can't do anything about what just happened, although it was, it was very hurtful, but we just now have to focus on, okay, how do we still keep Milwaukee in a positive spotlight for people to wanna come visit? Right. It's so true. So true. I think yes. that's really important. And, you know, there's so much going on, um, especially in a leadership role like yours. You know, there's there's a lot of, of burden to be considering. There's uh, good and bad in all situations. But I, I guess personally, how, how are you doing? How are you how are you feeling at this time? Um, you know, I have my days. I'm like everybody, you know, it's, it's an up and down. It's, um, an ebb and flow. Um, you know, at the center of who we are as an organization and at the center of who I am has always been around equity and justice and compassion for people and just fairness and just understanding that, you know, when one wins, we all win, that it is to our benefit that people can live quality lives um, and have access to, um, you know, wealth or access to resources that provide a good way of living. And to see what's happening now, um, it's revealing, again, in terms of what happens between the haves and the have-nots. Who can survive and navigate challenging times like what we're going through now? What I find myself having to do as a leader, though, is balance what I'm hearing, you know, because there's so much negative out here. But there's so much positive, you know, it's, it's like a yin and yang, you know, um, we are seeing people at their finest, um, you know, people who are really trying to be incredible in terms of serving and helping others, um, in spite of sometimes the negative, you know, remarks or the pessimistic environment that we often find ourselves in. So I have to balance those messages. I have to balance what I hear just before I go to sleep at night, you know, because what I hear before I go to sleep at night, quite frankly, determines how well I get my rest. So yeah. I have to be very mindless in terms of what I'm watching on TV or what I'm reading so that it keeps me uplifted. So, you yeah. know. I think that's a great takeaway. What you just said is to really balance what we're hearing. I think that's, mm -hmm. that's terrific. I, I want to say uh, good morning to some people watching. Karen, Julie, Connie, Katie, great to see everybody. We're excited that you're joining us today. So Dr. Hall, the Milwaukee Urban League, uh, this is something that has such an important and incredible presence in our community. Uh, mm -hmm. What is really the overall mission of what the league is, is doing? So for us, our focus is around economic vibrancy, and it's economic vibrancy, especially for African-American communities and other communities of color. Um, it's reflected through our work in advocacy, David, in education and employment, especially. Um, you know, when we think about our vision, especially for the Milwaukee Urban League, it is together with everyone to really become a first 
choice for African Americans to come to because so often, right now, we're considered one of the worst places for African American families in terms of our city and our state. So our goal is to reverse that so that we are number one in socioeconomic inclusion um, and equity and opportunities. Um, as the as the Urban League overall, David, we have been around um, nationally since 1910, locally since 1919. So we're one of the oldest kind of civil rights urban advocacy organizations in the country. We are 90, what we call ourselves is an affiliate. So there are 90 of us around the country in 34 states in the District of Columbia. And we represent about 300 communities. And um, wow. from the very beginning, you know, it's interesting what we've been saying now is that we were really, we were designed and built for a time like this because our focus has been around urban advocacy in education, employment, health, housing, um, civic engagement, social justice, entrepreneurship, kind of all the aspects of life. And each of us as affiliates determines which of those particular areas are most important for our city because you can't do everything. Although we advocate for all of those areas, we especially focus on the ones that I mentioned, which is the education, employment, um, and then just advocacy around those areas. Yeah, and I think that it's so key because you know one of the things that you learn a lot about on your website is the the real focus on empowering communities and and changing lives. And that focus on education and job placement and training, you know, it's so so key to reversing what you said and that is that we really are so so low on the ratings of of, you know, uh good places to live for um, minorities. And I, I think that it's really key that people know. And a lot of this that we talk about today, too, uh, people can find on your website, which is tmul.org. So um, mm -hmm. definitely check that out because if people are looking for resources, um, it's a great place to go. And I also uh, was curious, and you mentioned an affiliate, what about membership? Is that how your organization is based? Yeah, well, we have a number of ways that people can be connected to us. Number one, um, David, we have two volunteer auxiliaries. One is the young professionals, which are basically those under 40. And then we have the guild, which are the over 40. And these are just individuals who believe in our mission. Um, they volunteer to help us support us with our program. So they'll come in with certain initiatives and either do mock interviews help with readathons with students. Um, you know, some of them raise money for school supplies. Um, you know, they are at our different events supporting us. Like when we do I have our black and white ball, when we do have our equal opportunity day. Um, so that's a way that, that people can join us. The other is just simply being a member, just simply, you know, if you if you like what we do, we have different levels of um, you know, donations and support, um, which just keeps you connected to what we're doing. Yeah, that's so great. Yeah, now, I know so that you mentioned it earlier, but the COVID-19 and the pandemic that we're all in right now, you know, this is, yeah. this is so troubling in many different levels and everyone is experiencing uh, in different ways, um, really confusing and, and scary situations. So, you know, one of the things that very clear and everyone has known is that people of color are unfortunately disproportionately dying and being very sick from COVID-19. Um, one of the things that you mentioned in an article, you said one of the hardest results of this pandemic is its impact on the African-American community, especially mm -hmm. men in their 50s and 60s with pre-existing health conditions along with other communities of, of color. What really in your eyes have, has been the impact on these communities? Well, once again, um, you know, when, when we look at the, the black community and we look at where we are, um, let me do a historical twist, first of all. There's been about a 30% decline in the median household income for African-Americans since 1979. Um, we took a great hit when we lost all the manufacturing jobs um, because at one point 
you know, what is it? I think 80% of African-American men, they were employed. Um, you know, now you're talking over 55% unemployed. I mean, you know, the household incomes have taken a hit. The recession, um, you know, home ownership was huge for us. We took a hit with home ownership. So all those economic factors have made it difficult for us in terms of what are the kinds of jobs that we have. So um, unfortunately, I'm not sure for you guys, but Dr. Eve is a little frozen. We'll give her a we're, second. We're, we're in a lot of the essential jobs. So 40% of those jobs, they were gone for that. And so that's that's an impact because that means no health care. And if you have certain jobs, you have very limited health care. Um, you have very limited um, the flexibility in terms of your working because you can't necessarily always stay home. You don't always have that luxury. So, you know, people, whether you're white or black, if you're low income or if you you have minimal resources, you're living in stress all the time. And you right. know what stress right. brings on. Um, so that's, you know, your eating habits may not be that great. The way you work, you know, you take care of yourself. You don't always have the luxury to do that. So all of these factors impact how well we are doing with health. And then if you also look at, you know, the systemic racism, quite frankly, that we're dealing with, even when it comes to this policing, um, you know, um, our African-American men are walking around in stress all the time and stress multiplies all the other factors of our health. So come COVID, you know, you have this 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 pandemic that no one really knows about. Um, some of the testing was a bit uneven in terms of who was getting tested and who was not, who would go into the hospital and be sent home and who was able to stay in, in the hospital. Um, when we look at the housing patterns, we know that housing is a big issue um, in Milwaukee. And so we have multi-generational, you know, families living together. And if the spaces are small, you really can't do that social distancing. So, you know, you think about who has been able to handle this um, in a calm, sound, healthy way. It all depends on the resources that you have. It's and that's so the true. Game. Yeah, and one of the things you mentioned too is all of these stress factors that people are dealing with. And one of the things that I've been thinking about very consistently is, you know, how is this, you know, coming to influence people's mental health? You know, I was talking to um, Carmen at Sojourner Family Peace Center about domestic violence. In the mm -hmm. community, are these all things that you are seeing coming to the surface, unfortunately, in a bigger way based on COVID? Oh, absolutely, because it's it's an additional pressure. I mean, so we already know that in a in a household, when when you already when you have tension and and you're just trying to make it as a family, that's stress. But now you lose your job by no fault of your own. You're, you're, it's not as if you have a huge savings account. So right. think about our homes, you know, that's, that's hard. So yeah, you, who, in, in any situation, who do you take it out on first? We always take things out on those closest to us. It's unfortunate, but that's what we do. And right. so with the domestic um, abuse, um, you know, that's what's happening too. people are just, you know, they're stressed out. They're taking it out on each other. Then you have, you know, our kids that are then getting the brunt of it. And so, you know, I always try to say no home is perfect. Right. Um, we all have our challenges in our homes, in our relationships. But when you add additional factors of survival, additional factors of socioeconomic issues, that is a multiplying effect. Right. You know, I always, I've been thinking a lot about too, related to what you've said, is that what kids and family members see 
is becomes a modeling experience. And that's something that I've been kind of nervous about is knowing that there are kids in homes that are seeing all of this stress, all of this burden, people not knowing how to deal with those emotions and doing things that are dangerous and, and affecting um, each other in their household and, and kids seeing that and, and who knows um, what they are going to infer and how they're going to act out as well. So let's think about the You Matter campaign. I think that this is mm -hmm. a really, really key part to helping people. And I, mm -hmm. I just love this when I was reading about it, the Stronger Together Collective, um, this is the You Matter campaign. Tell us a little bit about what this initiative is about. So it's really a coming together of community leaders, you know, from different nonprofit sectors, um, really trying to resolve issues, you know, looking at different aspects of what's occurring in our communities and saying, what, what, what can we do collaboratively to move the needle, to make a difference? And I think what's, what's special about it is that everyone is coming together with a, a similar lens that, you know, as we push equity, as we push equality, as we push inclusion, diversity, respect, um, you know, a sharing of resources so that, you know, everyone can have a decent way of life, you know, coming from that lens makes a big difference in how we all work together and how we problem solve. And so to me, that's that's what makes the, the You Matter very special. And it's, you know, it's bringing people from different um, walks of life, you know, different races, beliefs, et cetera. But at our core, we all have that same interest. Yeah, that's so true. I think that what is happening with the You Matter campaign is important for people to check out because like you said, the resources are tremendous. And they're, I think where people are getting stuck, Dr. Hall, is that they're, they're like everybody, you know, sometimes we're nervous to reach out and to just even take that first step to realize that, you know, I can't handle all of this and that's okay. And I think that what the league and um, what this campaign does is allowing people to feel that it's okay. None of us can handle this on our own. And these are ways that we can help. So I really, really, really hope that people um, check out what's happening in the campaign because um, the You Matter focus of giving people um, to ability to stay informed, to be inspired, to be helpful, to, to get resources is really, really key. Yeah. What are you thinking? You know, we're, we're coming into, well, as we can see this week, fall is here. <laughs> yes, it um, is. And that means for us, winter is around the corner. And, you know, in my industry um, specifically, you know, I know firsthand that, that we're nervous um, because as we know, it's cold, it's uh, snowy, people hunker down, and it doesn't seem like the pandemic is close to being kind of out of our, our view for a while. Uh, do you share some feelings of nervousness in, in terms of the Black community and, and getting through winter, dealing with school and COVID and, and our current situation? Yeah, I just, I don't know if, if it's intensifying because the winter is coming up, to be quite frank. I, I personally believe, um, you know, it's still a matter of we're trying to survive this pandemic. Um, I think the biggest piece right now for uh, the Black community is around this digital divide issue, quite frankly. You know, um, with everything going virtual, David, um, you know, families are scrambling. And so, you know, along with the fallout from COVID um, is students not being able to be in school like they typically are. Right. Um, for all students, that that just plays a huge part in terms of their social and mental health, um, right. because right. we're as human beings, we were made to work together and be around each other. And so I think for the Black community now, it's about, okay, the educational setting has totally changed. How are we going to make sure that our children still learn? How are we right. going to make right. sure they still get um, some of the resources that they need. So when you talk about mental health, you know, how, how are we going to make sure that they're they're doing okay in this 
in this new environment. So it's while we know winter's coming and that adds another layer, um, right now um, I see our focus really being around how are we going to keep our children engaged? How are parents um, who may not have the flexibility of working from home. Not everybody can work from home. Majority of people that we depend on to keep our country going cannot work at home and they have families and children too. So, you know, these are individuals trying to navigate that landscape for their children with hopes that their jobs will stay intact. Because remember this whole eviction piece that, you know, Families who've lost jobs, again, under no fault of their own, now are trying to make sure that they continue to have a roof over their head. Now, that part is probably most important when it comes to the winter months, because we all want to be in a place that's safe and warm. Exactly. (laughs) One of the things that I was listening to on NPR the other day um, as just related to that is in that regard, in terms of keeping a roof over your head and not facing eviction, communication is key. You know, unfortunately, there are a lot of landlords who are not um, very heartfelt, like most of us would hope, but many are. And again, reaching out and communicating is really at least the first step of staying Mm -hmm. in your home and where you are. Um, you know, and I would things- say to David, I just want to say this too, you know, because you, especially when you talk about the You Matters campaign and some of the other initiatives, one of the things that I'm seeing that um, is is very encouraging to me is we have a lot of advocacy groups, quite frankly, out here that are putting pressure on those particular landlords that, quite frankly, you're rep- referencing that may not have the compassion for families and are quick to say, you know, quick to say that they must leave. But there are advocates out here putting pressure, um, you know, on landlords and trying to to just make a way for our families. So yeah, I just wanted to add that. No, I'm, I'm glad you did. It's, it's definitely top of mind for so many of us. I did want to let you know, and other people know too, that related to what you were saying about keeping kids and families able to learn. Next week, I was so happy that um, the executive director of the MPS Foundation reached out to me to be on DC Live. So Linda Willis, yes. So Linda Willis is gonna join us and talking about the hashtag connect uh, Milwaukee campaign so that we can share with people how they can help get these students in MPS connected and learning and engaged in school. So. We're going to we're going to talk about it because I agree. It's so important. Oh, so that's great. And they're doing a great job of fundraising around, quite frankly, hotspots. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Getting people the technology and, and, yeah. and tools. So yeah. excellent. Now, we t- mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, and of course, another top of mind subject is the systemic racism. We have all been um, really seeing and experiencing firsthand, especially in our area. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement. And one of the things that I loved that you said uh, in an article was that um, uh, Floyd's death pushed people who have been social distancing or staying home because of coronavirus over the edge, especially since this is not the first death of an unarmed Black individual. Now, of course, since then, unfortunately, there's uh, even been more examples of this. So do you think, Dr. Hall, that the city has reached kind of a breaking point or a turning point regarding race relations as a part of Black Lives Matter? I think the city, like many cities across this country, have been forced to deal with the reality that the systemic racism still exists, that there is still too much excessive force used on, quite frankly, unarmed black men. And, you know, when when we look at our own community within, we know that this has been happening for a long time, David. This this is going back hundreds of years in, in terms of just the inequities on how we've been treated. I mean, so we won't go into that. I think we know the history, but 
um, you know, in terms of policing, um, there there's always been a certain amount of tension between our police um, and in our communities of color. However, um, I think with the have and have not that that gap widening, um, the tensions between people. Um, I think we have a lot of political things that are going on. It has just raised some of the, the stereotypes, the habits that tend to not be good for communities to a new level. Mm -hmm. At the same time, what it did with the George Floyd for me was we were all basically home during that time. You know, as a country, um, we were having to reconcile kind of our way of living again, who we were, um, you know, how we were connecting with families. I think that there was a lot of kind of this soul searching and heartfelt reflection that was already going on just in the way we were now trying to live our lives in a manner that we never have lived before. We've never been limited in where we could go. You know, we've never had to deal with masks, you know, all these things, right? And as a country, we're spoiled because we're used to doing what, what we want to do. So then, you know, you take that and then you see such a stark, latent um, act of inhumanity towards a human being you, you know, that just takes you out. That takes you out, I think, number one, um, for African-Americans who've seen it over and over again, for it to be so blatantly in our face that way, it was just too much. I think for right. white Americans who right. heard about it, but not really seeing it in such a graphic way, those that have a real conscience about what needs to be right in this world, in, the, in our country, um, that affected them. So now you have a movement of, of people across race, across age. You have a movement that's not only occurring in cities, but has occurred in suburbs that have occurred in small cities and places we never would have imagined because there's this consciousness that has been awakened. And right. we know that while right. it is affecting us, primarily people of color, that all things have a way of coming around. So, you know, it's kind of like we, you, you, we have to look at, we need to make sure that no matter who a person is, they still have to be treated with dignity and with justice. And that there has to be fair and equal treatment when it comes to interactions, you know, with our police force, you know, and that's, that's, that's the one that's really hanging out there um, for us. And, you know, there are so many peaceful protesters out here, David, that, I mean, they are over 90% of those right. that are out there. Um, unfortunately, what has happened because the whole group somewhat changes in the evening, that's really what we found. And that's where you have the agitators that come in. And so, um, you know, but what we have to be conscious of as communities is to stay the course and not let this violence become a distractor or let it hijack the real reason that this movement and these marches began and still exist. It's still centered on justice, equality, and equity. See, I think exactly. I'm so glad this is being recorded because there are so many tidbits that you just said that are so, so important to us. Treating everyone with what they deserve in terms of dignity is one, but also the distraction. That's something that I've been worried about from you know the, the, the looters and the people that are, like you said, not the 90% of the peaceful protesters. Um, you know, this is a picture from from Kenosha after the yes. um, tragic events there. And, you know, we look at these images and people see them in person. And, um, you know, you just think, like you said, we cannot be distracted and we have to make sure that the focus remains on, on social justice. And I, mm -hmm. I'm so glad that you brought that up. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to use 
Um, what I really like that happened in Kenosha, David, is that people are working through what happened and saying, but we have to heal. We have to rebuild. And so, oh, you know, in no offense to anyone, but there's a scriptural, um, this, this script, scripture that says something, what was meant for bad becomes good. And, oh, yeah. you know, I yeah. look at how things may have been very negative, but how the community is coming together a different way. They have a long ways to go, but they're coming together. And I think that can be said for all of our communities, whether it's in Milwaukee, whether it's in Kenosha, you know, Minneapolis, where all of this really started, um, where they were really concerned, because I have a colleague in Minneapolis, uh, you know, there's the Minneapolis Urban League, who for them, you know, the people that came in that did all that looting, they weren't even from, they weren't even from the city, they weren't from the area, because many of the places that were burned down, um, there's no way that someone there locally would have done that, because there were some keepsakes that were touched. Right. And I think that that is where people are really starting to turn the corner in terms of supporting each other and coming together as a community because they realize that that's totally wrong. It's, it's mm -hmm. completely asinine for anyone to think that people coming in from the outside and, and destroying businesses and places to even make a situation worse, especially mm -hmm for black communities and, and other minority communities that can't have that happen and still be able to survive. Mm -hmm. So I think that for me, you know, I live near Wauwatosa and I was so encouraged to see that there were peaceful protests down the streets. And I was getting text messages from neighbors being like, you know, at first, oh no, they're on, you know, people are, are on our street and the cars are loud and the, you know, all of this, but it's, peaceful and it's really important for my kids and my family and our community to see that this is just not an inner city thing. So I, I agree with you. I just think that I am I am praying every day that yes. the compassion is what holds true and that those that have the compassion and the spirit of community are the ones that are seen and heard wider and louder than anybody else, because it is just absolutely what what people need right now and forever after this. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like you said, from bad comes good. And if we can have something like this in Kenosha and other areas in our community that is just, you know, God awful, somehow provide an example to everyone around the globe that we can come together as a community and we can make sure that we take better care of each other and provide better opportunities in the future for everyone is, is just the greatest hope, I think. And I think as individuals, you know, we each have a lot of power. Um, you know, I always say, so we each know at least 10 people, right? And if, if we have that kind of mindset, David, we can each influence the people that are in our sphere. And, you know, I think it is our responsibility to help educate individuals about what this is truly about, because oftentimes the news just does horrendous things in, you know, perspectives that are given or, you know, parts of stories that are given. And so really we have to do our work on the ground because those of us on the ground understand what's really going on and we know the people that are involved in these marches and you know there are very 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 good people involved in this marches with great hearts you know black white hispanic young old you know children um you know we, we see them all the time and you know i think that's a great hope when we see our children um having these perspectives you know their, their minds have not been as tainted. And there's so much more about inclusion and respect. And so we have to keep supporting these kind of positive attitudes and positive actions. That has to be our responsibility in the roles that we serve. Absolutely. Yes. And I, I, I think that what you said earlier, that this has really become a movement and not a moment, is related to 
again, what you also said about different people, all ages, all you know, classifications of society and groups and, and races and, and everything you can imagine have come to be somehow involved in this, whether it's a peaceful protest or other things. And I think the encouraging part of that is that people have maybe realized that we're not hearing every day from these big CEOs and big companies and people that have all kinds of money. Instead, it really is all of us, everyday ordinary people that have more power when we do come together. I think that's part of this in a big, big way. Oh, I have you frozen on my end. Hopefully, Dr. Eve. Hold on, I think she just experienced a little bit of technical difficulty. Hey, can you guys on Facebook see her? Make a comment so I know. <laughs> Sherry, I know you're watching, girlfriend. Can you guys see Dr. Eve? Just, oh, here's Chantel. Oh, Chantel's here too. Chantel, can you see Dr. Eve right now? We're having a little bit of a technical difficulty. No, <laughs> that's okay. She's gonna log back in and we'll be able to see her in just a second. Thanks you guys. Annette, Debbie, there you all are. <laughs> I'm so glad. Now we're just gonna wait a second because I think Dr. Eve is gonna, is gonna log back in um, so that whatever was happening with her internet hopefully is corrected. But this is such a good conversation and I'm so glad that you all are a part of it. Michelle, thank you. Um, Michelle just left us a comment. Amen to all of it. Vision, compassion, and unity reign supreme. Yes. I love that, Michelle. Thank you so much. So important. And as we're waiting for Dr. Eve, uh, Deb, thank you for this. It's so enlightening. I know. I'm just uh, hoping that she joins us again because you know, there's so many things that all of us as a community are concerned about, and it's so important to hear a voice like Dr. Eads really help us to understand so many parts of it, and most importantly, how we can be a part of a solution and a part of this community movement um, in a way that we're all comfortable with and, and able to be. So I agree. I think that's so important. Um, hold on one second. I'm just going to check on her for one second. Marquette. Thanks for joining us. And I'm glad you're enjoying the show today. Thank you, thank you. Um, Susan Thaney, thank you. It must be talked about, and I'm so glad that you all are part of today's DC Live to be a part of the conversation. Um, Annette, I'm so glad that you're learning too. Uh, that's what we're all about. And I agree that uh, there's so many people in our community that are coming together to do great things and and uh, Dr. Eve is certainly one of them. I just wanna see if she is, hold on guys, I know you're all patient. I just wanna um, do one quick thing to see. Okay, hold on, hold on. I think she's back, <laughs> hold on. Oh. Hey, you're back. Can you see me? Okay, I can see and hear you. Dr. Hall, you gave me a panic okay. attack. <laughs> well, you know what? All of a sudden you were gone. And I'm like, oh my goodness. And so what, was I gone all of a sudden too? Yeah, you were you were gone and, and I was like for a minute hoping, please, because we're having such a good talk. So thank you for coming back. Yeah. Uh, well, then you were gone. And that's what threw me off. Like your whole screen went. I said, okay. So. Gotta love okay. it. But I do want to let you know. That, yeah. I want to let you know when you were gone. I can't even tell you. You'll, you'll see later. But the comments are just, people are so grateful for you. And they are so, oh. so thankful to our conversation. And people are learning so much. And, oh, Florida Perry Smith is on too. Hey, Florida. Oh, my God. He works with us. You know that, right? I <laughs> love, love it. 
I love my Florida too. Super, super great lady. Um, yeah. So anyway, thank you for coming back. And I just wanted to let you know that while you were gone, I was chatting with our viewers and they're, they're learning so much and people are saying this must be talked about, learning so much, thank you. Great show, thank you for this, so enlightening. I'm learning so much. I mean, it goes on and on. So thank you, thank you. Oh, wonderful. Um, so we did talk about some of the unequal policing, but that's kind of a next topic for us to touch on related to Black Lives Matters and what we just talked about. Um, but I read something from um, Daryl Gibson II, who is um, part of leading or Leaders Igniting Transformation. And this is something that he said that really sparked in my mind um, so, you know, some really critical thinking. He said, the same institution that is here to protect us sees us as a threat. And if he was referencing his uh, community, black community. Yeah. It's so concerning that that's how people feel, but I, I understand that that's how they feel. Um, so how do you think the relationship between black, the black community and police has changed if it has? What, what are you thinking? Oh, I have a number of thoughts. So I'll go back again to, I think historically there's, there's been this tension. Um, unfortunately, there's this stereotype that is out here that is always about instilling fear when it comes to thoughts of black people and black men. And so, David, unless, quite frankly, the training of officers is is changed in some way, and I, I don't, I am not the expert on their training, so I know nothing about their curriculum. But what I know from what is being displayed, that there has to be a change in the way training occurs, so that all those potential implicit biases that you know people may have, because we're still all people are somehow addressed. And that when, when a police officer completes his training, that he feels just as much compassion and connection to all the people, regardless of whether they look like him or her or not. Um, and so what he's saying is so true because when we want to call the police now, we have to hesitate because we know that the turnout, the out, outcome rather, of that situation may go awry and be right. totally against what we were hoping for. And so there is something to that de-escalation training that they're speaking about. Because the other piece of this, David, I keep trying to look at all aspects. Um, what kind of mental health support do officers also get? Right. Because when you think about their jobs, okay, just forget about the inequities for a moment of what's happened in the street, but are we giving them the health and support that they need as officers so that they, they can maintain a certain calmness, a certain tone um, when they're in their jobs? So number one, I would agree with what Mr. Gibson is saying in terms of what ends up happening. And I think the stereotypes that are so often involved in this, which again, how do stereotypes form? Oftentimes they, they are formed from false information, from false experiences. And what, what um, how do you change that? It's from being able to interact with each other in different ways, in ways we haven't. And that to me is what is going to, you know, begin to change. Because all this is about hearts, minds, and souls. All of this is about um, who we've engaged in and who we've not. If I've never engaged with you or learned your experience or learned who you are and vice versa, it's gonna be hard for me to understand who you are. It's gonna be hard for you to understand who I am. Right. And we, and if we're right. depending on the outside information, but nothing that really deals with our own personal experiences and responsibility of learning others, um, we're always going to be trapped 
in a false sense of who we are and who others are. It's so true. <laughs> I remember as a kid growing up, and maybe because I don't have children now, I'm just unaware. But you know, even as a white kid growing up in the suburbs, I, I remember that there were opportunities for engagement with the police that had nothing to do with you know, crime or bad news. And I, you know, have kind of been asking people that live in, you know, the city and other places that are have much higher crime rates, you know, is this still happening? Are, are people interacting with the police and having relationships in their neighborhoods with them? And it doesn't seem to be um, really the culture that continued um, since I was a kid. And I just remember that that, that made it so much more approachable. Um, and, yeah. and I also, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was, I was also thinking, you know, people might, people might laugh at me for this because I'm not a fighter and I'm not an aggressive person, but the one thing that I kept thinking of, and it relates to what you were saying about police training is I was watching what happened in, in Kenosha with Jacob Blake. And I kept thinking to myself, like whatever happened to just jumping on somebody? Like, mm. you know, he was, there were so many opportunities in that video where those police officers could have simply like jumped on him yeah. and knocked him yeah. to the ground. So I don't know, I'm like you, I'm not the expert with training and I've certainly never been in a situation like that. But I, I kept thinking, I think we're getting way too off track about how you can detain a person without having to automatically, you know, grab a weapon or become violent. It yeah. seems off to me. Well, and I, I believe that's, that's what we all saw, unfortunately, is three officers to one man who was not a huge guy at all, no. um, that there just could have been so much more done than shooting someone seven times. I mean, that is just, it, it just makes no sense. Um, and again, we have to go back to training. We have to go back to, um, you know, approaches that are being used um, because we don't, you know, what are people thinking in that in that moment, right. you know, that makes them go to that extreme? Yeah. So we just have to keep taking this back to, I believe, the training. The other piece of this is, um, you know, you're right. I believe that there were a lot of programs at one point in which police were in schools around education. You know, there were just more opportunities for positive engagement between communities and police forces. And, and I do believe that there are still some out there. You know, there are efforts around safe and sound, which I think has engaged um, our police departments in a very positive way. I know I was on the um, board of Near West Side Partners. They had a very strong relationship that was formed. So I think that there are still pockets of examples where community and police are working together, but this, there's an opportunity for so much more of that. I think the other piece that people keep talking about, and, and it's um it's a controversial issue, is you know for public servants of that sort, should they um, be relegated to living in the city, mm -hmm. or should they have the opportunity to live wherever and still have the responsibility of policing in cities? There's a sense that. You know, if people don't live in the city, there's not going to be that same commitment and concern for citizens as they would, you know, if they weren't. And so I don't know. I mean, I've, I've, I hear both sides. Um, I still think at the end of the day, it is so much around education, training and exposure and that we have to revisit what yeah. that looks like, you know. For right. Them. And right. Another part of this that is just. I don't know, it's it's tragic, of course, as well, but there are some, now what you're reading stories about are these other kind-hearted and, and, you know, proper thinking, rightfully trained and, and caring police officers who are so distraught about what is happening with others. Yeah. And they're committing suicide, they're, they're it's just, 
there has to be a way where we can realize that it, it doesn't have to be this way and that the police have such an influence on how our communities grow and stick together. So I, I was so impressed too. The Urban League, of course, um, coming out with a statement that you all uh, nationwide, all of your affiliates, um, uh, uh, or um, your National Urban League, along with the Wisconsin affiliates, had sent to people mm -hmm. that are responsible for policing in Kenosha. This is something that can be checked out on the website. But again, taking a stance in terms of, of protecting um, so many people in our community is, is so key. Um, you know, and one of the things that I, this is a picture that I saw and I was so disturbed by, by this. Um, but again, in Kenosha, um, and, and this is our streets being protected by, you know, federal agents and military weapons. Again, the, the, the visual piece of how this influences and affects people I just think it's it's dangerous in, in so many ways. There's one thing I want to ask you about, um, and I think this is part of what could be a solution. Um, and, and this is kind of the conversation around reallocating funding uh, to some public mm -hmm. health and equity efforts that are focused on um, black and brown residents. I think I saw something um, of a in a conversation to take 25% of the budgets of the Milwaukee Police Department, for example, Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office and State Patrol and shift the money to public health equity efforts focused mm -hmm. on black and brown residents. Is this something that you're um, getting engaged with and something that you're um, uh, supporting the concept of? Yeah, we, um, so what we've said is, uh, as an urban league is number one, we do not, we don't support defund the police. Um, you, you can't do that, all right? And we and we need our police force. So I want to just make that statement very clear. Um, but we do stand, um, David, with the reallocation that you know um, that we should revisit how funding is used for police departments because, as they've even admitted, often oftentimes they're called to scenarios that they're not skilled to really address. So I think there is some, something to the fact around social workers, psychologists, you know, others who can help come and deescalate or assess a situation so that it doesn't have to end up being so tragic. So, you know, we, we support that. We, we've got to, we have to reimagine, um, you know, how budgets are used, how the police departments, um, uh, spend spend their money what does that look like in a way that supports what they need to do but also supports the community and you said something about officers and i, I just want to say we also as an urban league we salute and support the police departments and the work that they do what we are pushing though is there has to be accountability mm -hmm. and a price that police officers who do not follow the right rules or use excessive force or do the wrong thing. Hold on for Dr. Hall, I think. They have to be have to have suicidal thoughts. They shouldn't have to feel bad. But, you know, I, I believe that, again, it's a system that is not supporting truly in the end the ones that are trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. That's, I'm so glad you said that. I mean, it's so, so important. And I, I'm hoping that we see some improvement. And, you know, I think we've had some turmoil and chief of police and other things in our, in our department leads. I just hope that people realize moving forward as, as other selections are made and other appointments are made, is that it's okay to, to find people that are tough, but that also have compassion. Because if we do not have that from the leadership at the top of these yeah. police forces and things, it's not going to be helpful. You know, you have to have a well-balanced leadership that can allow people 
to feel like it's okay to be a compassionate police officer and to still understand the land of the, the law of the land and to protect its people. So I, I'm hopeful that that's gonna, that's gonna be something that comes of this too. So Dr. Hall, reclaim your yeah. vote. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I see people coming together. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. So I, I wanna talk about reclaim your vote. Um, this is something too that we've got, yes. got, got to get people going um, and it's coming up. So this was really cool. Yeah. Uh, you know, Kamala Harris, here she was. Um, and I think this is really neat for all of us, but um, no matter what we think politically, um, Kamala mm -hmm. Harris, the first black woman to be nominated for national office by a major party. Uh, she stepped on ground in Milwaukee the other day, um, which was uh, exciting for a lot of people. And I'm exciting, excited that she's bringing attention to the community as well. Um, now this is off, uh, this is off track and I don't know, like some people might think it's weird for me to ask, but I, I just, what did you think of those Chuck Taylors? <laughs> you are funny. <laughs> of course I love it, right? <laughs> I, I thought it was a nice touch. Nice touch yeah. there. <laughs> so funny. Okay, more important, yeah. hashtag reclaim your vote initiative. Tell us the five key components to this initiative. So the five key components, uh, number one is, is voting. Um, so making sure that you are, you know, registering yourself to vote. Um, num number two is understanding the voting options that you can vote absentee. You can do the early voting. Um, you can vote on the day of. So just knowing the different ways that you vote. Um, number three is information on the candidates and information on um, what they stand for and what the issues are. What are the things that you need to be thinking about when you make your selection? Um, number four is polling site information. Where are the polling locations so that you know where you need to go? And then number five is basically vote, vote, vote. So, you know, vote early, bring a friend, um, be patient. You know, the lines may be long, but, but vote. Um, the National Urban League actually has a partnership with Lyft. Um, so there may be some opportunities even for us locally in terms of making sure that people get to the polls. So Reclaim Your Vote, David, is really about, you know, educating, informing, engaging, and making sure that people vote. And in our community, when we think about voting, especially as African Americans, people died. They lost their lives. We had a our recent leader, John Lewis, a cracked skull just so that we could have the opportunity to vote. So we are, um, you know, really encouraging the importance of all of our voices being heard, but especially, of course, you know, as an urban league, we focus especially on our African-American community. And so making sure that we're, we're at the polls. So we were a site um, chosen by the National Urban League to make sure that, you know, there's some support given as we really push the Reclaim Your Vote. Fantastic. And coming up on December 18th is Black Voter Day. What is that about? So it's just basically, again, like making sure that African Americans are voting, you know, that realization, that encouragement again, you, you know, it is important to vote, it is important to be registered. So that's basically what that's, that's about. Oh, good. So, and I did see Kamala Harris, just so you know, um, through the Urban League. So we had the opportunity in the last few years, she has actually been a speaker at a couple of our conferences. So, you know, very impressive. And yes, you know, just in terms of, what she represents now um, on a ticket and, and who she is as a person, um, we're just very, we're very proud of. So, and I happen to be a member of one of the sororities, we're Delta Sigma Theta sorority, and you may have heard her talk about the divine nine, which are like the nine African-American fraternities and sororities. So, right. you know, right. we're, we're excited to be able to see that, you know, someone who's part of that divine nine, part of the fraternities and sororities, which have a huge history in this country, you know, is, is on that prime ticket, so. 
Yeah, that's so great. One of the things that I love too is just by seeing on the the, the videotape that I saw of her visit, um, especially when she was just with the public in the street, it was mm -hmm. so, you know, just, I had the sense anyway that it was so authentic and just, you know, totally open. Um, she was, you know, excited and happy to be in front of people, but I just got the sense from her gestures and her, you know, expression that she was genuinely excited to be there and to be, um, you know, with people. And to me, that in itself somehow was heartwarming and, and positive. And that is her. I mean, I would just say, I didn't know who she was. I mean, before this time and hearing her for the first time at the National Urban League conferences, um, she was always just very genuine, down to earth, very candid about, you know, what needs to happen. So I have, I have a lot of respect for her. So exciting. We'll, we'll see what happens in the months to come, but hashtag reclaim your vote. Yes, uh, find out yes. with lots vote, of, of vote, great vote. information. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so one last thing before we wrap up, and um, unfortunately we're just gonna have to touch on it, but I, I know that, that people are, are loving this conversation. And one of the things that was so important to me to really be looking into in preparation for this conversation was just this concept of opening up uh, leadership opportunities. And I had read this article in Forbes that was just such an eye opener to me. Um, but some of the things that it said, you know, whether it's representation in the boardroom, access to venture capital, or knowing that, the, or knowing the right people, ethnic minority groups have very little say and or opportunity. Another statistic that I just was disheartened by, there are only four black CEOs in the Fortune 500 2020 list, and that was updated in July. Um, because one dropped off. Um, so I think here's, here's in coming up to a question. For white people, a good education and forthright attitude opens the doors to employment and career progress. It doesn't necessarily always seem that way for black people. Why, why do you think it might not work the same way? Hold on. Okay. There you are. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so I missed some of what you said. All of a sudden, you froze, and I may—I guess I froze too. But I think it had to do with really access opportunities. That's what I think about. So, um, and you're right. So, for us, we have to have connections. We have to have access because. The statistic that you talked about where you're talking about four CEOs of color um, compared to the rest lets you know that there is basically a pipeline that does not include us. It is a pipeline that basically invites those that know each other. And so that is the history of our country in terms of who's in leadership and who's not. So quite frankly, you know, for us, networks are so important. The people that we know, but even more importantly, the people who know us and know the talent that we bring and who have a commitment and openness to understand that diversity also means economic growth, because when you have representation, when you have uh, diversity of thought and approach, that can build a business or build an initiative or build a platform, whatever the case may be. So you're right. I mean, for us, it, it is, it's about connections, David. That's what I see. We can have all the um, degrees in the world, um, you know, all the education, but if we really don't know anyone who is willing to open the door, um, share the table with us, that's where our own entrepreneurialism is so important, where we have our own businesses that we can lead. But even with that, when it comes to contracts, um, when it comes to building our business, it is about our relationship with the banks, it is about um, you know those who are willing to take a chance to be venture capitalists with us. Um, so it's the connections. 
Yeah. One of the things that I was thinking of too is that um, it, it might seem as if COVID-19 is, is kind of providing some access to a wider group of talent. And one of the things that I hope is that it really starts to provide opportunities for us to create a more equal work environment. You know, it's not good to see people losing their jobs and getting permanently laid off and, and, and huge changes um, right now. But I'm kind of hopeful that it really does kind of open up the door to people making more specific choices of inclusion and equity in the workplace because the talent pool right now is really wide open and there are people that are, are ready to get to work and who can, like you said, have a seat at the table and to improve a business and to improve a culture and to provide talent that was missing. And the black community is so full and rich of these kinds of people that I, that's one of the things I'm hopeful about coming out of COVID. Well, and I'm seeing um, leaders step up. I mean, I think about what the Bucks did most recently, you know, when they took that stand with not playing the game. I mean, it may seem small, but look at the ripple effect that it had across the country. And so I, I challenge, you know, our, our business leaders to continue to look at ways that they can take a stand, not only for um, hiring new people, but also just supporting those that are already in their businesses and making sure that, you know, have they truly created an environment for upward um, mobility and career movement in their companies? And what can they do to just improve their own landscape first? And then think of ways that we continue to, you know, build the seats at the table but not where we're just at the table, but where we have, we're empowered to make decisions and where we are true leaders and executives, um, you know, in, in those roles. Absolutely. Absolutely. I am on board. So lastly uh, is um, your, your black and white ball, which is so well known throughout our city and has such a rich history um, as a great fundraiser. Um, people love it. Uh, this year, it's virtual, um, but I want to make sure that people know about it. So, so tell us, coming up in November, what can we expect? Yeah, so Saturday, November 21st, um, first of all, you know, we were crushed because, you know, that in-person ball last year, David, we had 1,200 people at the ball. Wow. And just the energy, there's just a certain energy that we have been able to create at our black and white ball for over 30 years that has involved, you know, again, multi-generational, multi-racial, gender. I mean, you know, it's, it's a who's who of everybody from business to community, et cetera. But um, Florida Perry Smith, who we mentioned earlier, she is still our event um, strategist. And so she is the one behind the scenes working with the team. Tans was actually part of that team who's our internal um, and others, Denise Callaway. And we've got um, community volunteers who are helping us to make sure that that night is still going to be fun. So. We are going to be creating rooms that, you know, we're going to have special guests in that, you know, certain sponsorship levels will be able to benefit from. We will still have, you know, some of our giveaways and some auction items. Uh, we will still have live music, you know, so there will be opportunities for the music. And we're really looking at, you know, how, um, in fact, we'll get a lot of different people from across the city still involved, still highlighted, so that it will still be a night of activity and a night of interaction, even though it will be virtual. But, um, you know, I just urge everyone still come. It's virtual, but I guarantee you that you will have um, a great time that evening. And again, you're giving and supporting an organization, the Milwaukee Urban League, that is so critical, especially as we look at recovery. Um, with COVID-19 recovery economically, you know, we we are here to serve. We are here um, as an urban league, both locally and nationally. So, yeah. you know, join us yeah. on November 21st. Coming up November 21st, make sure that you visit tmul.org for information on how you can attend, participate, sponsor, um, give money to, you know, what I'm hopeful for this year, because 
especially from what I've learned during this conversation, there is so much need. And my hope is that you guys blow out the ceiling of whatever money you have set as a goal to raise, because I think that what you do is so incredible. And the influence in our community and people that, that need the resources is, there's nothing better. So I, I'm, I hope you guys knock it out of the park. <laughs> Thank you. Trying to do our million. I'm telling you now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm rooting for you. I am rooting for you. Thank you, um, David. Thank you. Thank you always for your support and enthusiasm for us oh, and for the community. Yes. You know, Dr. E. Paul, this really has been such a special morning for me. And I am so excited that we had this time. I really do admire you in so many ways. And I know that our community is is better for having you in it. So I want to say thank you for joining me. And I can't wait to see you in person soon. I know. I know. We can mask. We can social distance mask and say hello. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Because we're long overdue. We were supposed to do this a long time ago. So <laughs> I know. Get together. We're going we're, we're to make it happen. So um, yes, be yes. well, my friend, take good care. And I, I will talk to you soon. I really appreciate it. Okay, the same to you. Bye. Oh, wow. Oh my gosh, so many of you were saying yes. Thank you, Karen. Um, very impactful. Uh, we're so happy that you guys loved our conversation today. I, I just... I just love that lady. I think she's so awesome in all ways. So thanks for joining us. I do want to let you know, next week, Wednesday, September 16th, I am so excited about this because this is actually a rare conversation. But join me Wednesday, same place, Facebook Events by DC, 9 o'clock. We are talking with Commissioner Lafayette Crump, who is the... Uh, Department of City Development in the Department of City Development. Amazing guy. And this is such a great time to be talking about development in our city. And joining our conversation is the direct executive director of the MPS Foundation. I mentioned this earlier, Wendell Willis. Uh, he is heading up the hashtag Connect Milwaukee campaign, which has to do with uh, getting kids in MPS back to school with the right technology and tools. So, so much to talk about next week. I am so happy that you all were here today for DC Live. It's been a pleasure. I hope you have a great day. Stay happy because it's kind of gloomy and we will see you next time. Bye guys, have a great day.